to do a little more stuff. OK. Recording is started. I'm letting everybody know that they're being recorded and transcribed. OK, <clears throat> uh, so just real quick what I had said before this bit up here talking about pre pro insulin, pro insulin and then active insulin, like the steps of it, which comes first, which is second, which is third and kind of like what comes off is a test question. Always has been a test question. A lot of this kind of the insulin and glucagon um, gets brought up a couple of times. Um, is there a separate section of questions on this chapter? For like the Linus learning stuff? Uh, I can look. Yeah, if you could look look at that, we can probably run through a couple of those. I'm trying to think um, what kind of is the best thing to to set you all up. Um, not just for this class, but for like the overall future. A good chunk of this is is repeat. It's like the steroid and thyroid hormones and the vitamins and stuff like we this stuff here. We talked a lot about this in previous sessions about like the nuclear receptor and I mentioned like make sure you know the thyroid hormones and what they do and everything because he loves to ask questions about that. Um, when we start talking about glucose. This is when like we'll um, glucose. This will feed into actually this week's material of like the carbohydrates and stuff, the formation of glucose and the different um, carbohydrates. A lot of this hopefully is review that we have our main carbohydrates, fats and proteins. Um, do you remember calorie wise? How many calories are there in one carbohydrate? Oh, that is correct. There's four. 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 What about fats? I, fats and proteins, I don't remember. Fats have nine. Proteins also have four. And then another one that you should know, alcohols have seven. <clears throat> this is why a lot of people... Um, who drink drink quite a bit tend to get like the belly and um, tend to gain weight because alcohol has is very quickly digested. It goes right into the bloodstream, and it also has almost double the amount. It has almost the double amount of calories as carbohydrates and fats or carbohydrates and proteins. So fun fact. Also, this is my own personal little soapbox. Do you guys know they came up with a study recently showing that every single time a person drinks alcohol it actually kills um neuronal brain cells just a fun fact there any 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 quantity of alcohol so okay um this also, getting I'm into not seeing a hormonal regulation you're not seeing it? okay mm -hmm. that's okay i'm just going to go through the his powerpoint and kind of highlight and show you guys what the most important things are. <clears throat> and we'll get through this stuff fairly quickly. Um, pancreatic hormones, these two, the pancreatic hormones and the adrenal hormones. This is super important because these two, you are going to talk about literally through every single class that has to do with diagnostics or physiology or anything because these are so interconnected to everything that the body does okay so the pancreatic hormone you have insulin and you have glucagon hopefully all of us know the disease concerning insulin is diabetes mellitus right or as some people will pronounce it, diabetes mellitus. I don't know which is kind of correct. But it's fun to say diabetes. So <clears throat> diabetes mellitus is actually a desensitization 
desensitization of cells to insulin. This means it is harder for the cells to take up glucose. Glucose stays in the blood. Bad things happen because of that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it's weird that that's staying there. That's fine. Um, with what we need to know for this course in general is going to be more of the kind of what happens with insulin and glucagon. <clears throat> so, for example, insulin, it's responsible responsible for glucose uptake from the blood into the cell. Why is why is that necessary? Why do we need the glucose to go from the blood into the cells? Because we use the glucose for um, energy. Exactly. <clears throat> You'll hear this pop up again later on down the road. You don't need to know this right now. This is just to give you an introduction. You'll hear about glute transport proteins. And there's a couple different types. There's like glute 2, um, there's like 2, 4, I think there's like a 2A or something like that, 2, 4. Many ones remember glute 2, glute 4. Um, you'll hear about those later on down the road. They're just the specific transport proteins that help glucose get across the cell membrane to get into cells. Again, you don't need to know that right now. That will come back a little bit later on down the road when we start talking about glycolysis and like and how and it how goes. It goes. So my glycolysis and and everything getting into the cell and stuff like that. <clears throat> um, biggest thing we're gonna remember right now is kind of the that is is this responsibility of insulin where it's responsible for getting the glucose from the blood into the cells, okay? And there's a nice little chart down here later on that we can kind of see the effects of insulin on the body. So when we see here, when we ha release a bunch of insulin, we increase our glucose uptake into the muscle, the adipose tissue, and the liver, adipose is the fat tissue. We also increase glycogen synthesis because if we have a bunch of extra glucose, we're taking in more glucose, we need to store it somehow. And the storage form of glucose is glycogen. This is another thing really, really important. You'll start to see a lot of these like glyco words just making sure that we know what each of them means um, because it can completely change the way a test question like what a test question means depending on the word that he's that he's using okay <clears throat> so we increase glucose uptake into the cells which makes us synthesize more glycogen because we're storing away more glucose we decrease the glycogen breakdown because we're making more glycogen we increase um, glycolysis. So if we think about the breakdown of this word. Glyco is considered referring to glucose. Glucose. Lysis. Who remembers what lysis means? Breaking apart. Yeah. Breaking so breaking, down. breaking down or apart of glucose to make ATP. And us and I'll say and pyruvate again. We'll talk. We'll get into all of this later on down the road. I'm just introducing it to you now. So to make ATP and pyruvate, which will turn into acetyl -CO CoA and go into the Krebs cycle to make more ATP. Okay, so this is what you need to know right now. All of this will come later. Just introducing it right now. Okay. And 
I did find the thing on Linus. There is one. Oh, there is one? Okay, mm -hmm. sweet. Um, if you're able to, like, control print it and send it to me, um, either through group me or in chat here, whatever it is that you can, can do, okay. you can open that up in a in a few minutes. Okay. Um, we also have here, so that's like glycolysis, getting that acetyl-CoA formation. We'll increase our fatty acid synthesis in the liver, so we take the glucose molecules and we'll produce, turn it into fatty chains and turn them into fatty acids. And triglyceride synthesis in the adipocytes. Adipocytes are fat cells, fat tissue, adipose tissue, same thing. And we'll make triglycerides, which triglycerides we'll learn a little bit more in way down. Where's the TCA, DC? That's actually one of your first lessons in biochem two. You'll get into fatty acid formation. So we'll talk more about that. Oops. We'll talk more about fatty acid formation and all of that in biochem two. Okay. And so what's cool, so this is all insulin. When we increase the amount of insulin that we have, all of this stuff happens. So if we look at the other side of the coin, we have glucagon. So literally what we do is we take glucagon, everything that happened with insulin, we flip it and say everything that's happening with insulin, the opposite happens with glucagon. So with glucagon, all the way back down here, we have decreased glucose uptake. We have decreased glycogen synthesis. We have increased glycogen breakdown, decreased glycolysis, decreased fatty acid synthesis, and decreased triglyceride synthesis in adipocytes. So it's cool about this. You can try and memorize both of them if you want, but if you think about it, try and follow it a little bit logically, starting at the very beginning. Like, what are their jobs? Insulin lowers blood glucose by pulling the sugar, the glucose, out of the blood into the cell. Glucagon raises blood sugar by pulling or by breaking down the glycogen and putting glucose back into the blood, specifically from the liver. Okay. And like I said, these two guys, these will come back over and over and over and over again, especially in, in Phys 2, in Tri-3. You'll have a whole unit just over the pancreatic hormones. Um, okay. I don't think he asked those other questions. He might ask these questions. Let me. The <clears throat> type of cells, there are specific cells within the pancreas that make these. So insulin made in the beta cells. Glucagon is made in the alpha cells. And we won't talk much about them now, but there all are something called delta cells within the pancreas. And this you will see more in Fizz 2. Just know that they're a thing. We don't really concern ourselves much about them. Now, eventually they'll come back up. Okay. Adrenal hormones, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and cortisol. We already kind of talked about these guys um, a little bit um, in previous ones. Understanding the main one that we're going to focus on is cortisol. That's the biggest one and the one you'll see continuously throughout everything. Cortisol is known as the stress hormone. So this past week that y'all have had tests and everything. After you finish all of the tests and the stress kind of is relieved a little bit, 
How do you how do you feel? How does your body feel kind of after going through all of that? Exhausted. Tight and exhausted. Exhausted. Has anybody ever gotten sick after a long testing weekend? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. So cortisol is the stress hormone released when we're stressed, especially for long periods of time. And its job is to increase blood glucose during stressful times, okay? So it main keeps our blood glucose a little bit higher. So that way we have the energy. It's almost like putting ourselves kind of more into that fight or flight mode. Um, just like a little bit not quite as extreme as what like something like adrenaline would do. Um, but it keeps our blood glucose high so that way we can continue to do and finish all of the stuff that we're supposed to do during that time. That's cortisol's job. The negative side of it is it suppresses the immune system. So this is why a lot of times after those stressful situations, people will get sick because cortisol rides high, it rides high, it rides high, it rides high. We finish all of the stress, our cortisol levels drop pretty aggressively. And because our immune system has been suppressed during that time, we get sick. So that is the explanation to that. And again, you'll learn more, a lot more about this later on down the road um, in Phys 1, in Phys 2, a lot in Phys 2, a lot in systems pathology, kind of what can happen if we don't have enough cortisol or if we have too much cortisol for long periods of time, that kind of stuff. If we have like a tumor of the adrenal glands, what happens if we're getting way too much cortisol? You'll you'll get into all of that later on down the road. Just that this again, this make sure we recognize these hormones. Our blood glucose. So again, we already covered most of this. So our our ideal blood glucose is eighty to one hundred. Uh, I think it's units blood glucose normal. Milligrams per deciliter is, and you'll see all this, 70 to 100, something like that. In most cases, around 100, or a little bit less than 100 is good. Let me actually change that. Milligrams per deciliter, there we go. So our insulin lowers our glucose, glucagon increases our glucose. Epinephrine is our Epinephrine is the same thing as adrenaline. I can't spell. There you go. If anybody's, any of us have experienced an adrenaline rush, we start to kind of shake. We get really jitter. We get really wide awake. That's because our blood sugar suddenly spikes. And that's much more of our short-term stress response. Fight or flight. Have you guys heard of the, I don't know if you guys are talking about it in DAA yet, um, the sympathetic versus parasympathetic nervous system? Oh, yeah, I remember that. Have you guys Before, talked about that yet? Yeah, we're doing that in BCT. Okay, yeah. sweet. So our epinephrine is our sympathetic nervous system response. So adrenaline. So if we're thinking about fight or flight or sympathetic response, what kind of things would you expect to happen with maybe the heart or with the lungs? Racing heart, quick breath. And, yep. Our heart's going to increase. Our breathing rate's going to increase because we're flooding our body with oxygen, prepping. Our muscles might get tense. Um, you also get pupillary dilation. Your eyes dilate, and that's to be able to see better. Um, yeah, and then the the opposite side of that, if we have the parasympathetic response, it's going to be the reverse of that. Heart relaxing, breath slowing down. Blood, rather than going to like the extremities and the muscles, it's going to the abdomen. It's called the rest and digest is the parasympathetic nervous system. But yeah. Very cool stuff. Nervous system is, is amazing. There's a lot of really, really, really cool stuff there. 
Okay, so it's epinephrine, epinephrine. What we really want to know is our short term, very quick, rapid response. Then we have cortisol, which is our more long term response. So it's again, like I said, it's with that stress, it reduces the immune systems to fight infection. And um, so cortisol it being a hormone, it takes a little bit longer for it to um, to send its message and then also to die back down. Remember, neurons and the nervous system connections, those are super, super quick messages and responses. The hormonal system is a little bit, it is overall slower because it uses the blood as its highway to carry its message. And it takes a while to filter out all of that hormone once it stops releasing. So it's a little bit a little slower response. Okay. Um, big focus, the hormonal signal for blood glucose is in the liver, the muscle, and the adipocytes. Big ones we focus on is liver and muscle. Key thing to understand is once glucose enters the muscle, it never leaves. It physically cannot leave. And that's because when it enters, a um, when it enters a muscle cell, it gets phosphorylated by an enzyme called hexokinase. You'll learn about that again in the future. I'm just introducing it, the word to you now. It gets phosphorylated by hexokinase, and in order in order to leave the cell, it would have to break that phosphate bond. Which, because that's a high energy bond. It's not really good. It's not going to be able to do that just on its own. And we don't have an enzyme to break it to let it go out. So it never leaves out of the muscle cells. The liver holds a bunch of glucose and glycogen and releases it into the blood as needed. This is why it's really, really common. I don't know if you've either know of somebody or have heard of ever like a fatty liver disease or somebody has a lot of fat in their liver. This is this is that th this is due to the liver's response to hold glucose. It holds on to the glucose, holds on to the glycogen. It's a very main like storage organ for it. And when we saw one of the things um, when we have excess glucose, it turns it to fat. So that's when we start to we store a bunch of glucose in our liver and then it turns to fat. And so then we have a bunch of liver of fat in our liver. And that's when we get fatty liver disease. The liver's main job holds all that glucose to be able to release into the blood as we need it. So they've converted to the glycogen like we talked about. Um, all the hormones when we release glucagon. We break down the glycogen by a process called glycogenolysis. Again, this is very important. Un know the words and read the word appropriately. When you see any of these glyco words, slow down really quick and read it and see like, okay, what is this word actually saying? So glycogenolysis, it's literally just the breakdown of glycogen. And go release it all into the blood. We talked about both of those already. Uh, oh, he does have it in here as well. Those beta cells in these cells, in these um, cl clusters called isolate of Langerhans. That's where these hormones are both produced. Um, this will be a test question. Either. B cells, alpha cells, which is produced in the B cells, which is produced in the alpha cells. Or it'll say which of the following produces the pancreatic enzymes or the pancreatic um, hormones, isolates of Langerhans. One of those in some way in that here will a guarantee you will be a test question. If not, two. Um, insulin counters high blood glucose. Uh, glucose taken up majorly by muscle and adipose tissue that converted to glucose 6-phosphate. 
and that's again by that enzyme. Does anybody remember the name of that enzyme? Something kinase. Good, it's a kinase. Hexo kinase. Hexo kinase, that was it. Yeah. So. Sure, because there's a. Yeah. So we have our hexokinase. This is super, super important as well, because there's actually a second enzyme that I'm going to mention right now that he will ask about this at some point. So hexokinase is in all cells and phosphorylates the glucose. And then there's a special one called glucokinase. Does the same thing but only found in the liver. So <clears throat> you'll see a question about these. Both of these will pop up. Just understand hexokinase, if it's talking about any other cell besides the liver, muscle cell, adipocyte, any of those guys, hexokinase. If it specifically mentions the liver, we yes. want the answer to be glucokinase. He does mention that on a test question. I can guarantee you that. Yeah. Insulin secretion, we have, this is what our insulin looks like, where we have something called our pre-pro-insulin, pre meaning before, so before pro-insulin, we have that whole setup, we have a signal sequence that gets booted off, and it turns into pro-insulin, and then this whole peptide chain right here gets booted off. And then we get our mature active insulin. Like I said, this, this little process, he'll the way that he'll word the question is something along the lines of um, before pro insulin um, or before the release of the signal sequence in the formation of pro insulin, what was the formation called pre pro insulin? So just know those three words, those three steps, the three words, what they are, and then what comes off for them to mature. And if we think back again, insulin, now this mature insulin is going to go off. And what's the name of the receptors that it's going to bind to when it gets to the cells? Tyrosine kinase. Hey, thank you. Tyrosine kinase. Sweet. Tyrosine kinase, remember this. This comes back in Phys 2. And it comes back like the full. So do, so do thyroid hormones. I should mention that as well. You spend a lot of time on thyroid hormones. Insulin, glucagon, thyroid hormones, um, adrenal hormones, all of these. You're getting introduced to them now. I promise you they are extremely important. If you understand the basics of them now, you'll set yourself up way better for the future classes. And also every time that you hear these in future classes, really pay attention. I think they mention it, they'll mention it a little bit in DAA and in BCT. Pay attention to these. These are super important hormones. <clears throat> a lot of hormone type questions on boards as well, because a lot of diseases come happen due to abnormalities with the levels of hormones. Okay. Um, here is one of those glute glucose transporters. Um, it, well, those will pop up. I think there's this is not as much here. He might have a one question here. I think in the book it goes over roughly what these are. Um, but you'll you'll see these a lot more in Fizz Fizz two. Uh, we already talked about all of those. We talked about that chart. There's its membrane receptor. We have our insulin binding. The tyrosine kinase, just as Liz so graciously told us. Glucagon. Then here's the glucagon. It does the opposite. It gives all the opposites. 
the mechanism of action of glucagon. Glucagon is a G protein coupled receptor. So remember our G protein coupled receptors. I promise you the G protein coupled receptor comes back in other tests, especially when talking about glucagon. Ah, what the heck? And here we go. This little chart. This is one I'd probably save and kind of look at it and understand kind of the flow of it. Um, eating or fasting. Dr. Sarkar talks a lot about fasting state, well-fed state, and starving state. Um, well-fed state is right after eating, fasting. Um, it's like, I don't remember what he, the actual definition is like around 18 to 48 hours-ish, that kind of area. So let's say like 24-hour mark, give or take. And then starving state is greater than two days without eating. This will come back, especially if not in this class, it'll come back in biochem too, when you talk a lot about like ketones and ketosis and all that sort of good stuff with um, talking about those metabolites and all this sort of stuff. But <clears throat> uh, if I remember correctly, he'll, he'll ask a kind of question that's along the lines of in the well-fed state, what is happening to blood or which of the following is happening to in in the blood and it's like blood glucose is um their insulin is being released due to increasing blood glucose something along those lines understanding that when we're in the well-fed state and we've just eaten insulin is going to start to be released glucagon is going to stop being released um, and then all of those things that we talked about that can happen, the processes that can happen after that, um, any of those kind of answers are fair game. And then in, in like in the fasting state, what is occurring? Oh, well, the blood glucose is low because blood glucose is low. Glucagon is being released, acting on the liver and the adipocytes, increasing the amount of glucose being released into the blood. Um, in order to increase blood sugar. Something along those lines. Christine, does that sound about right as far as what he'll ask test-wise? Uh, Christine's acting like she's here, but she's really MIA. <laughs> it's okay. She might have had to step away for real quick. But yeah. Okay, so that's all of it. Joseph, were you able to pull those um, questions? Yes, I sent them to your group me. All right, let me pull that up. I would have sent them to your email, but I don't have it. <laughs> I I got it. Do you go Do you go by JC or do you go by Joseph? JC, yeah. Okay. All right, sweet. I guess I'll ask you guys, um, do you guys want to go over these questions or do you want to go over, continue with like material and keep going through like his, his slides or the book? Personally, I'd say questions. I feel like that helped me a lot with like the G-couple protein stuff. And so I think that'll help. Sweet. Does that sound okay with everybody else? Mm-hmm. Okay, let me hold this up as a PDF.
that I can. Well, while this opens up, is everybody doing OK emotionally? In the program right now, it's a it's a lot. I know that feelings start to can start to bubble. Yeah, I definitely had a moment today where I was like, I'm too old for this. What, what am I doing? <laughs> but I got through it, so it's fine. And I want you to go ahead. Go ahead, Cheryl. I'm sorry. I'm pulling up the Linus questions also. So we're going to do uh, bioenergetics and carbs. Uh, we're going to do the regulation of fuel metabolism in this one. I definitely feel a lot better after the tests happened. Once the once they were done. That. I would agree with that, JC, because like <laughs> especially a couple of them, I like I did better than I thought I was going to. And so I was like, oh, OK, like it's fine. But still, Same. like it was just the stress leading up to it. It's like, oh, my gosh, I'm about to bomb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, that's. You kind of get that feeling, especially the first round of exams, the first like big round of exams when like and especially in try one when you're still trying to figure out kind of what the heck is going on and what are teachers actually going to be asking and looking for all that sort of stuff. It's definitely way more nerve wracking. than once you get a little bit deeper into the program, it gets um, easier and try to. It's I wouldn't I don't know if I'd say necessarily easier, just a different kind of challenge. <laughs> that's, that's what I'll say. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yeah. I will I say like also each... that after all of this, I am in desperate need of an adjustment. <laughs> like, <laughs> my neck hurts so bad, <laughs> but. I don't know if they've told you guys this um, as try ones, if you're here, you can go see an intern. Yeah, I just don't want to go through the three hour thing before. They will adjust me. <laughs> like, I that's just fair. don't want to do fair. it. <laughs> um, I can check on the open adjust hours. I will be on campus tomorrow if they have any open adjust time. Um, I'd be happy to to meet up with anybody who's on campus while I'm I'm there finishing what I got to do. That would actually be awesome. I'll take a look and see if um if there's any time. I really, I really like. I know what I need. I need a neck, and I need anteriors. <laughs> That's what I need. <laughs> have you, have you, uh, have you had an, your occiput adjusted before? Yes, it's my favorite adjustment. I love it. Okay. And it honestly, helps that's my whole spine. Like we found out, for me, that's the best adjustment for me. So the biggest thing is here's my little clinical pearl for you guys. When you start getting into adjusting. The most powerful adjustments are the transitional segments. So occiput C1, CT junction, C C7 T1, and then the TL junction, T12 L1. Those are the ones where the, there's the, should be the most movement. And it's really, really cool to see if you adjust the occiput and you adjust the CT junction 99% of the time, the rest of the neck, you don't need to touch at all. Because there's so much happening, so much of the inside of the neck is a um, is an is a, an effect is a an after effect because of the lack of movement at the CT junction and the occiput. And it's also really, really cool because those areas right there. <clears throat> don't have any of the the vessels of the vertebral artery running straight through them. So the likelihood and chances of even if somebody's more susceptible to have like a vertebral artery dissection or stroke in that area, you actually avoid a lot more of the possibility of that happening by focusing on those two regions above and below. So, yeah, just what yeah, I have. 
I, the octopus I learned... lift looks gnarly, but it's probably one of the safest ones for sure. Oh, and, and it feels so good. <laughs> yeah, it does. And then I can also attest to TL Junction being, especially anteriors at the TL Junction. Oh, yes. <laughs> like... Oh, yeah. Hey, Drake, which uh, line of learning quiz are we doing? We are doing the regulation of fuel metabolism. Right. I had to figure out which one we were on. I'm like, which one are we on? Okay. This one only has about 20 questions, so we should be able to get through it decently quick. And like I said, I do want to spend a little bit of time on this because this stuff comes back, comes back up so many times in the future. Like, really, really learn and understand these. Um, it'll help you a lot coming up in the future. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> activation of which hormone receptors are known as autophosphorylate known to autophosphorylate themselves at their tyrosine amino acid resi residues by its intrinsic kinase activities insulin Keyword. receptors yep that's going to be correct keywords tyrosine kinase all this other stuff, really a whole bunch of extra. So what, what this actually means, because I'll go over this really quick, because this will this is what is going to come up in Phys 2, and honestly, this never made sense to me. Basically, all this is saying is we have our membrane receptor right there, and here's our tyrosine kinase. Insulin comes in all happy and binds, and the binding of insulin causes this whole thing to phosphorylate itself. That's all that's saying. And for some reason, teachers really struggle to explain that concept. And it's really, really annoying. But that's all that it, ha all that it is. That's all that happens. Very, very straightforward. Bam. Next question. In elevated insulin levels in blood, we'll do which of the following? Inhibits glycogen synthesis in the liver and muscle. Inhibits glucose uptake by liver. Stimulates below normal levels of blood glucose. Or stimulates synthesis of fatty acids and triglycerides in the liver. Inhibits glycogen. So let's look at, so we talk about insulin, right? What's what's all happening with insulin? So when insulin, insulin in the blood, what's its job? What's its purpose? Increase glucose uptake. Increase glucose uptake. So where is that glucose going to go? What are the th three places that it can get, get absorbed into that we talk about? Uh, muscle, blood, I don't know, Fat I remember liver. the third one, liver. So it's coming at, it goes liver. Oh, it comes out of the blood. So muscle, yeah. liver, and then uh, adipocyte, is that the third one? Adipocyte, perfect. So it goes from the blood into these cells, right? And then from there, if we're taking in glucose, taking in glucose, taking in glucose, now we have a bunch of extra glucose. What do we do with it? What are we going to do if we have a bunch of extra glucose? We need to maybe save it for a rainy day. We need to store it. Put it into glycogen. Exactly. So we put the extra glucose into glycogen. This is glycogen synthesis. <laughs> You're good, Christine. <laughs> so we're going to glycogen synthesis. So instead of inhibiting glu glycogen synthesis, we're actually going to increase glycogen synthesis in the liver and the muscles. Same thing here, the next line down, inhibits glucose uptake by the liver, 
We're not going to inhibit it. We're going to encourage glucose uptake by the liver because we want to decrease the blood glucose and put it into the muscle, the liver, or the adipocytes. Um, stimulates below normal levels of blood glucose. That's just, no. We don't want, insulin is normal, and we don't want to have below normal levels of blood glucose. So our answer is going to be that it stimulates the synthesis of fatty acids and triglycerides in the liver. Kind of the process of that is that, so we have a bunch, so high glucose in the blood, it gets taken up into the liver, and if we remember, it's phosphorylated. Let me actually look up real quick. What glute transporter is in the liver? Glute two. Okay. Gets brought in the liver. I'm going to put this right here by a glute two transporter. As soon as it gets brought in, it gets phosphorylated. Do you remember the name of the enzyme that phosphorylates specifically in the liver? There's hexokinase glucokinase. everywhere else. Glucokinase. Yeah, glucokinase. Phosphorylates it. And now we have a bunch of extra glucose. It's converted to potentially to glycogen. Or it can be added to other stuff to make fatty acids slash triglycerides. It's not until bio tri triglycerides. There we go. It's not until biochem two that you really get into kind of triglycerides and kind of what they are. Um, but I'll show you this is this is what they are. This is a really good picture. So it's a type of fat um, triglyceride tri being three. So we have three fatty acid chains right here. Bound to a glycerol and glycerol is this composed structure right here. It's triglycerides. So what happens, what we do is we get these glucose molecules and we literally stack a bunch of those glucose together, form it into a big chain. That's a fatty acid chain. And then we stick three of those together and we form a triglyceride. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about like what a fat is. And that's why fats carry so much more energy than carbohydrates. Because if you think here, we have a whole bunch of bonds with stored potential energy, because that's all calories are, our potential energy. And so carbohydrates are more simple glucose molecules. Whereas this has a fats have a ton of bonds and that's why they carry more energy. So when we talk about triglycerides, this is what we're referring to. So we're going to stimulate the synthesis of fatty acids and triglycerides in the liver. Um, other things that we could have in here. So this could also be um, if we were to say we could change this question and have it be an elevated glycogen level. In blood, do which of the following? Yeah, uh, sorry, do in blood, do all of the following, except this would still be the same correct answer, just a different way to ask, ask that same exact question. As you remember, whatever insulin does, glycogen does the opposite. Any questions on that? Feel good? All right, moving along. <clears throat> we have another pretty much the same question. An elevated insulin levels in the blood decreases cellular uptake of glucose, inhibits glucose uptake by the liver, D 
decreases fat synthesis or increases glycogen biosynthesis. Okay, hold on. I do have a question. Yeah, what's up? You said whatever insulin does, glycogen does the opposite? Correct. Uh, nope. Glucagon. Sorry. Okay. Glucagon. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Glucagon does the opposite. Whatever insulin does, glucagon does the opposite. See, this is this is why it's very, very important to read all these words. And personally, what I would do, all of the words that sound similar, I would literally write those. So glucagon, glycogen, glycogen, glycogenolysis, glycolysis, gluconeogenesis. All of these words. Uh, I think that's all of them that I'm there might be another one or two. But all of these look very, very similar. But it's very easy to read. Read them wrong. Just, and or even say them wrong, just like I just did. And so make sure that you when you see any words like this, slow down take your time make sure that you are reading it correctly and know what each of these mean okay thank you so much for for catching that okay this question so in elevated insulin levels in the blood does which of the which of the following will occur increase glycogen biosynthesis correct And let's say we get a bunch of glycogen stored in the muscles of the body. Are we able to take that gly glycogen out of the muscles in order to share it with the rest of the blood? No. No, once it is in the muscle tissue, it is in the muscle tissue for forever until the day that we use it or the day that we die. Okay. Going through here. So an example of steroid hormone is glucagon, thyroid hormones, testosterone, or nitric oxide. Testosterone. Yes. Thank you. So test here's another thing. We could change this question and ask the question. Which of the following is a G, G protein coupled receptor hormone? Then what would the answer be? Thyroid. Is it thyroid? Or would it be nitric? Remember, these two, our thyroid and our testosterone, are nuclear hormones. Nitric oxide is not a hormone. It is a, a molecule that is going to vasodilate the blood vessels. Glucagon is a G protein coupled receptor hormone. So glucagon for that one, if we rephrase yeah. it. Yeah, if we rephrase it, it will be glucagon. Okay, um, what are potentially other steroid hormones that we could put here instead of testosterone? Estrogen. Good. What else? Cortisol. What was that? Cortisol. Cortisol. Yeah. And there are a couple of other ones, but those are the main ones that we'll talk about. Estrogen, you can spell estrogen, cortisol, testosterone, progesterone, those kind of ones are all going to be our steroid hormones. Um, real quick, cortisol. Cortisol is also known 
as a corticosteroid. So it's steroid right there in the name. Cortisol or a corticosteroid. Okay. <laughs> I, I predicted the future, I guess. Glucagon mediates its actions through which of the following? G protein coupled receptors. G protein coupled receptors. I did not do that on purpose. Okay. Hormonal regulation of blood glucose by insulin is an example of which of the following? Covalent modification, glucose by synthesis, positive feedback control, and negative feedback control. Is it negative feedback control? It is, in fact, negative feedback control. In, in using our own words, can we describe what negative feedback control means? Is it like, so I don't really understand the positive and negative feedback, but like, is negative feedback like there's too much of this? And it's going to cause problems, so we're going to send this in to de decrease it. Think of the feedback control. Another way to say this is a feedback loop is a good way to think of it. So it's a lot. It looks something like this. So we have in. Let me actually. Yeah. So we have increased blood glucose. With increased blood glucose, pancreas releases insulin because it has, has a re there's a receptors on the pancreas, and those receptors realize like, notice how much blood glucose that there is in the body. So the pancreas releases insulin. Another way to write this: we have an increase in insulin, in insulin production. Uh, thinking backwards, remember, what are the name of the cells that release insulin, or that create insulin inside of the pancreas? Remember what those are called? Beta. Beta Sorry. cells. And they're inside of an isolate of what? Langerhans. Langerhans, Langerhans. perfect. OK, so when we release, we increase the amount of insulin that we have. And that leads to what's that going to cause for the amount of glucose in the blood? Should decrease it. The blood glucose is going to decrease. So because we have increased insulin and then the blood glucose starts to drop, this comes back, it feeds back to the pancreas and stops the release of insulin. So that's what feedback, negative feedback, because it's negative, because it's negatively affecting it. It's stopping it from continuing to occur. So that's what a negative feedback loop looks like in its super simplest form. You'll see a ton of this in Phys 2. You'll actually go over almost all of the main hormones and do feedback loops and draw feedback loops just like this for all of them. A positive feedback loop or positive positive feedback control. Let me actually show you guys. Um, my brain just oxytocin. There it is. Oxytocin feedback loop. This is one, it's a different one. So oxytocin, this is <clears throat> the actual oxytocin loop right here. Now, this one's a little bit confusing. Let's look at more like this one. Oxytocin, there's, there's very, very few hormones. If you don't know and something's asking you about like regulation of something and it's if it's hormonal especially, if you don't know the answer, 95% of the time, or 99% of the time, the answer is going to be a negative feedback loop. The only exception to that is, is oxytocin, 
and I think there's one other one that's slipping my mind right now, but this is the one where the <clears throat> and when you're giving when a female's giving birth and the baby's head starts to push against the cervix, it causes nerve impulses to go to the brain, to the pituitary gland, which stimulates the release of oxytocin, which causes the contraction of the uterus, which then causes the baby to push more against the cervix, which sends more signals. And that's a one of the only feed forward or positive feedback loops. That's another name for it. Positive feedback control loop or a feed forward loop. So it's one of the only, so very rarely are you going to pick this as an answer, unless it's talking about oxytocin or I, I again, like I said, I think there's one other one that does that does a feed forward as well. Okay, so just so I'm gonna just clarify. Um, so negative feedback loop, like th the simplest way that I can describe it to myself basically is we need this to stop. So we're gonna send whatever in to stop it. And then positive is like, I need this to happen. So I'm gonna send in oxytocin or whatever to make it happen. I'm gonna say change change it just a little bit. So it's going to be we're currently releasing this hormone or doing this thing. And because we've done enough of it, we're gonna send a message back to tell it to stop. And then for the feed forward, it's we need this is happening. We need more of it to happen. So we're going to make more of it happen. OK, does that make sense? Yes. Sweet. Yeah, so like I said, most of the time. We're going to have with hormones, look for this, that negative feedback control. OK, insulin is an example of blank, which of the following. If we think back real quick. Test our memory. We have pre pro insulin from pre pro insulin. What does it turn into? Pro insulin. Is pre insulin. Or is it pro insulin? You might be right. Uh, where did it I think it goes thing? pre pro 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 and then mature pro. Yeah. Pre pro. You write, you write pro insulin and then to mature insulin. If you remember to go from pre pro insulin to pro insulin, we lose the, I think it was called the activations sequence or whatever it's called. It's called the, where to go, where to go, where to go, the signal sequence. So the signal sequence comes off. And then after that, the pip what comes? Yeah. C peptide. C, C peptide comes off. So out of all of these, what do we think it is? Peptide hormone. It's going to be a peptide yeah. hormone. Um, catecholamines. These are going to be our epinephrine, norepinephrine, those guys. Ecosinoids. This is going to be biochem two. Um, ecosinoids have a lot to do with the in, with fats, with immune system, that sort of stuff. You'll learn about that next trimester in biochem two. Just so that way you have a little bit of knowledge of what it is, so you don't look at it in a question and be like, "What the heck is that?" Insulin is an example of, hey, look, it's the exact same question. Just now they have cytokine here instead of eucosinoid. Cytokine is also related to inflame, inflammation and the immune response for the body. So again, insulin is an example of a peptide hormone. Insulin is secreted by the blank cells. Beta cells. Beta cells. Beta cells. What's what do the alpha cells secrete? Glucagon. 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 And then let me make sure the. 
Thanks, Shane. <clears throat> I'll tell you now, because you'll hear about this eventually. The delta cells secrete the hormone somatostatin. Um, and there's a pretty cool, like, you'll talk, you'll get more into this in physiology too. There's a little bit of a loop between all of these of the alpha cells, delta cells, beta cells. Um, I'm not going to get into it now because it's it's above our pay grade right now. But <clears throat> if there's a there's a really, really cool little bit of complexities within the pancreas that are just really, really cool the way that it all kind of works together. And then um, I'll add this in here as well. This isn't super important, but you'll see this later on. The parietal cells. Parietal cells are just you have the little isolates of Langerhans, which make up a very small percentage of all of the um, of the cells of the pancreas that secrete the glucagon, the insulin, somatostatin. The remaining, I think it's a uh, what percentage of the pancreas are the isolates of Langerhans? Yeah, so the isolates of Langerhans make up about 2% of the pancreas as a whole. The other 98, 99% or so are the parietal cells, and they are in charge of gastric acid secretions. You'll see these, these will come up eventually later on. You'll see amylase, protease, lipase, these kind of things. These are enzymes that break down and digest stuff. Again, not important. For right now, just in the future, that's what you're going to see. Great job. One of the functions, okay, one of the functions of insulin is to regulate blood glucose levels. To perform this function, the active insulin molecule is produced from its precursor form. Which of the following biomechanical procedures is used to form the active insulin module from its precursor? Be so if you remember, if we go back and we just look, we look at this right here. We talk about this. Things are getting broken off and coming off. Um, there isn't any mention of a, a kinase enzyme. Okay. Which would phosphorylate. So, but if things are getting broken off, our root word, what is our root word for things getting broken off? Lysis. Lysis, right? So immediately we're thinking, okay, it's got to be some kind of lysis that's occurring. Phosphorylation, reduction, acetylation, or to the lysis there, right there. Because of the lysis there, what's happening in the reaction, we know that that's going to be our answer choice, proteolysis. Um, we also, in this case, the protein... Proteo, proto, protito is talk, again talking more about, about proteins. And if we think proteins, if we think back to when we were making proteins, proteins are made up of what kind of bonds? You have an amino acid chain that's made up of what kind of bonds? Peptide. Peptide bonds. We think back our insulin, not our insulin, our... Yeah, our insulin is an example of a peptide hormone. It's made up of amino, a chain of amino acids. So the breaking up of proteins, of peptide bonds, prototolysis, breaking up of those bonds. This is why I say it constantly. Check root words. Every single time that you see new root, wor root words and stuff, um... Write them down, figure out like what the word itself actually means. Um, and that'll help you a lot, especially with boards. Boards, especially part one, has so covers so much information and so many broad topics that it's really, really difficult to just raw memorize everything. Understanding root words, oftentimes it might not get you all the way there, but it'll give you that 50-50 shot. 
which to be honest, especially in boards, you only need to get half of the questions correct to pass boards. So if you can get a 50-50 shot, chances are you're going to pass boards. So understand the root words. Uh, again, this is another... I think this is almost the exact same question, isn't it? Yeah. Same answer, just a different way to ask the question. The maturation of insulin from its precursor, pre-proinsulin, involves proteolysis, breaking off of proteins and breaking the peptide bonds. What condition can produce mature insulin from its precursor form? So which of the following situations is going to make us have lots of or have insulin be produced? We have high blood glucagon levels, blood glucose levels lower than normal, blood glucose levels higher than normal, or high blood sodium ion levels. Blood glucose higher than normal. Exactly. And then again, we can we can look at this question and think, okay, if we were to change it, what condition can produce our glucagon? Glucagon, or we could insert a whole number of things into here. Then we would look at this and say, okay, what can have that? Why would glucagon be released? More likely to be this blood glucose levels lower than normal. So, see, it's, it's very super simple just to switch one or two words in these questions and pump them out as test questions. What is one of the effects of increased levels of insulin in the blood? So we have, have more insulin in the blood. It decreases fatty synthesis. It inhibits glucose uptake by the liver. It increases glycogen biosynthesis. It decreases cellular uptake of glucose. Increased glycogen biosynthesis. Perfect. Ooh. What is one of the major functions of glucagon? You see, kind of seeing how repetitive these questions get. Mm -hmm. Increases um, <clears throat> blood glucose levels. Yep, it increases blood glucose levels. What is true about the insulin receptor? It's tyrosine kinase. Tyrosine kinase. Elizabeth, I expect you to never get a tyrosine kinase question wrong as long as you live. Yeah, I will never get that wrong ever again. <laughs> um, what is true of cell? That's a very bad question. <laughs> okay, let's see. All of the above are true, or in this case, all of the below are true. ATP and glucose levels must be kept constant. ATP is constantly broken down to yield energy, and it is never replenished. Cells, cells does not transport glucose when blood glu glucose level is low. That's a bad question. It is a very bad question. A my terrible question. My guess, it's either this one or all of the above. It's a it's a weird. How about that you? <laughs> that is a weird question. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna say uh that's 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 a no bueno question. <laughs> I yeah, I don't that's 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 gross. If oh you broke okay. it. Can you guys see it again? We good? Did it come back? Yeah, it's back. Yep. yep. Okay. It's a little temperamental. I if, think it's time for a new computer, Drake. <laughs> yeah, I looked into the cost of that. I, I, this computer actually gave me the blue screen of death, and I uh, brought it back from the dead. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> twice, actually. I've, I've done that twice. <laughs> it was a, oh yeah, it was a, it was a whole process. Um, what, what condition? Leaves free pro insulin to form insulin. Really, this question is asking what within what condition does insulin activators insulin then released? Blood glucose levels higher than normal, lower than normal. Yeah, this, again, this is 
the same question, almost the exact same question as above. So if you, so if you can't tell, this is probably going to be like what the test, what the kind of the questions the test is going to ask you. Hey, Drake, do you remember if he includes um, G protein, like how we do that cell signaling assignment? If he includes that on the exam, I can't remember. I believe he did. I'm fairly certain that it comes back up. It it most often, I think you'll expect a couple of questions on it. Okay. Es especially like he'll probably add it into like the 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 um, glucagon. Because like with it within glucagon, when glucagon binds to its receptor, which of the following will occur? And it's going to be like um, PKA is activated or something along those lines. So it's like it's going to be a G protein coupled receptor re question, okay. just disguised as a. I just couldn't remember glucagon question. If I remember correctly, that's that's what I remember. I'll go back and look at my exams again. Okay. <laughs> Which of the following conditions can activate glucose transporter proteins for cellular uptake of glucose? Abnormally high levels of blood glucose. None of the above. Abnormally low levels of blood glucose. Abnormally low levels? Let's look at this. So glucose transporter proteins, a.k.a glute proteins what are their what is their job transport glucose to where it's needed specifically from the blood but so glute protein glute proteins bring glucose from the blood into the cell so does that sound like an insulin job or a glucagon job insulin insulin job. So when is insulin going to be activated? High levels of blood glucose. With the high levels. Exactly. So just re read the question really carefully because again it mentions in here cellular uptake as well of glucose. So we just need to read, read the question carefully enough to say okay, which of, which of them is going to be activated? Is insulin going to be more active or is glucagon going to be more active? And then answer based off of that. I'm not really high. OK, which of the following? High. What was that? Abnormally high, correct for that one? Yeah, abnormally high levels of blood glucose. Which of the following hormones enhances glycogen breakdown in the liver? So which of the following hormones is going to cause the liver to break down glycogen? Glucagon. Or glucagon. <laughs> glucagon. See, that, all the words start to blend together. They do. Oh, yeah. Sweet. Last question. Uh, last question. Which of the following is an anabolic hormone? It's either cortisol or epinephrine, but I'm going to go with cortisol because it's a steroid. So this is a really, really good thing. A lot of times we hear the word anabolic, we think we think steroids, right? So what anabolic actually means is um, specifically when we're talking about biochemistry, it's the biosynthesis of complex molecules molecules right that's why when you say like anabolic steroids what they do is they cause the building and the creation of complex molecules in the muscles to cause them to grow so that's what they're actually actually doing so when we talk about anabolic hormone encouraging biosynthesis if we think cortisol when we have release of cortisol is that what 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 does cortisol do again for us? What's its job? Get us through long term stress. 
By doing what? What is it doing, let's say, specifically to the blood glucose levels? Uh, keeping them increased. Keeps them high, right? So in order to do that, is it going to be building a complex molecule, let's say, like glycogen? Or is it going to be breaking down a complex molecule like glycogen? Breaking down. It needs to, cortisol will be released, and it's going to break down glycogen in order to keep the blood sugar levels high. Epinephrine, remember we talked about epinephrine. Epinephrine being that sympathetic response, that adrenaline response. It, does that raise blood glucose levels, or does that decrease blood gl glucose levels when it's released? Raise. It raises. So what's it doing to glycogen? Breaking it down. Breaking it down. What about glucagon? Is it building glycogen or breaking it down? Building. Building. Is it? Mm. What, is, what does glucagon do? It's telling the body to spit out more. Stores it. Yeah. Glucagon, remember glucagon, is going to release sure. the, blood, the blood sugar, or it's going to release glucose into the blood to increase blood sugar. This is where it gets just kind of it can get a little bit all kind of all together. So all three of these are actually breaking down glycogen. Remember because glycogen glucagon when blood sugar is low glucagon is released and glucose is then released back into the blood to increase blood sugar. Whereas insulin, what's insulin's job? What does it do with the glucose? It decreases it. Yeah, muscles. And yep, so, so glucose goes from the blood to, to the cells. cells so it brings it in and once we have a bunch of it in we make glycogen right so right there there's the key we make glycogen we are synthesizing we're biosynthesizing glycogen so insulin is an anabolic hormone which would mean all three of these. Do you remember what the opposite of anabolic is? Would it just be bolic? I don't know. <laughs> just. I think catabolic. Catabolic. Okay, yeah. Okay. Makes yeah. sense. That, yeah. that ring, ringing a bell deep in the crust of the brain? Yeah. Yeah. I Way did... back in... Dig back in week one or two. <laughs> yep. So do you, you kind of see how that information? It's kind of starting to come full circle now. We're starting to reach and apply and apply things into that we've learned talked about before. Not yeah, it hit me like a truck when best. you said it. Yeah. Yep. Not that this is the best strategy, but with like especially like the quiz and stuff is specifically on this information. If you know, if I couldn't remember. It, insulin's probably the answer because Dr. Sarkar likes insulin. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> okay. In, Not that that's is, the best yeah. strategy, but well, so this is you just picked on something super, super important that I want you to. I actually want you to focus on that through the entire program. Taking a test is just as much about knowing the information as it is about knowing the professor. So my strategy going into every single class is that I outrageously over prepare for the first exam in every single class. Like I, I just I kill myself for the first three, four or five weeks before the first exam. And then when I take the first exam, I look for patterns or for like topics and stuff that the professor 
really likes to highlight. And I'll look at things like, okay, does is this did the study guide that they provide, did that really help? Is most of the test information, is most of it coming from like the reading material that they sign? Is most of the testing material coming from the PowerPoints? Is it coming from live lecture? Kind of what's it coming from? And then for the next exam, I know, okay, because teachers have patterns, they're going to continue with those same patterns. Okay, so what's that teacher's pattern? Okay, I'm going to focus on doing X, Y, and Z that matches up with how they write their tests. And that's kind of the game that, that you can start to play as you go through the program with different teachers. So very good strategy. It's, it is a very good strategy. It's honestly very pay attention to what the teachers like and what they kind of talk about because I mean, they're I just kind of figured like you can't know everything especially with all of the stuff we're trying to learn all at the same time so if i can like this question has this answer is it asking anything even remotely close to that okay it's probably that <laughs> like yep and it's also some other tips um a lot of teachers if they give all of the above answers 50 50 shot it's going to be in all of the above um if they have if they like um a little bit longer worded questions like if like oh, let's see which one uh, kind of stuff like this even like a little bit longer than this like if it goes out to maybe like out to there again you're typically better off guessing the longest answer choice as it like again because it's statistically the longer answer choice tends to be more correct so if you're if you're full on guessing you know a good chunk of the time the longest answer choice tends to be tends to be the most correct so little test taking strategies as you as you go along Okay. How's everybody doing? I'd say okay. Mm -hmm. Do you feel a little bit better about the hormones? Oh, yeah. Everything that goes on with them? Yes. Okay. Now, if microbiology Let's... would just get along with that as well. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just going to touch on this really quick. Um, I'm going to go over a couple of the... Some of this is actually a little bit of review. Do you remember in the first chunk of material, we talked about delta G and whether something's spontaneous or not? Yes. This is, is continuing off of that idea. So it, it's based in that delta G, based in like that spontaneous reaction type stuff just getting a little bit more into it okay so for example here, again here we have our change in free energy our delta g <clears throat> we talk about the total energy in a system when we talk about in a system we're just talking about like a defined space so like a single cell can be a system. The space around two individual molecules can be a system. The entire human body, so we can talk about the entire human body is a system. Or we can talk about the entire universe is a system. It just depends on kind of what, like whatever a system is, whatever it's like, a system is just referring to like the area around what we're talking about. Okay. We can talk about the laws of thermodynamics. He will have a test question that's literally just which of the following represents this law, second law of thermodynamics or something along the which of the following is the first law of thermodynamics where this one is, it's mostly this one. Energy may be transformed to another energy, so energy cannot be created nor destroyed, only transformed. 
what that's referring to. Remember when we talked about this before where we have a bond. When that bond breaks, I want a more cool looking line. If it breaks, right? A lot of the times we have release energy in the form of heat. So it's going from a chemical stored energy to a heat energy and along like like something like that where it's just being transferred is being turned into something else that's what the first law of thermodynamics is saying our second law of thermodynamics we introduced this word called entropy we have two words enthalpy and entropy I enunciated those very, very specifically because it's very, very important that you do not get them confused. OK. So we have enthalpy, which is our delta H or the change in the heat of the system. So thinking about um, like the amount of heat energy being released. And delta S, which is entropy. Um, if I do remember correctly, he likes to have a question where he literally says which of the following is the equation for um, like the relationship between the free energy and the change in entropy. And like this equation is the answer choice. So you want to make sure you know the equation and know what the variables stand for. What the what the placeholders we're going to what their names are for. OK, so. Should I find the best? OK. Yeah, we'll look at enthalpy. We'll start with enthalpy. We'll talk about the the temp like the energy, the amount of energy and stuff that's in the system and how that how that changes. And we'll look at entropy. So entropy. I'm going to talk about entropy for a second. So entropy, the way that I learned this and the way that it was described to me, entropy equals the amount of chaos in the system. OK. The more stuff there is, the more chaotic it is. OK, so. <clears throat> What this is meaning is if we have, let's say we have a. A glass jar, right? With water in it. This little jar is our system. And I'm going to drop a bunch of, let's say I drop a bunch of sodium chloride. Oops. I drop a bunch of sodium chloride into the water. When I drop sodium chloride, sodium chloride is a salt. When I put salt into water, what happens to it? Not a trick question, I promise. Uh, it dissipates. Mm -hmm. Exactly, it's going to dissolve, dissipates into it. On a chemical level, the sodium and the chloride literally break apart just like this, and they separate, and it dissolves all into the water, right? This action is an increase in entropy. Because we went from having one thing, one molecule combined, to now having two separate molecules. So if we increase the amount of stuff that there is, so we increased 
from one molecule now to two separate molecules, we get an increase in entropy. An increase in entropy, if we look here at our equation, if we increase, so a T is absolute temperature, so T is constant. Our T value is never going to change. It's always the same. We can essentially put it in here as, as a one, right? If we increase our delta S, so if we increase the amount of stuff here, is our delta G, is our delta G going to get a bigger number or is it going to be a smaller, potentially more negative number? Negative. More negative. Perfect, it goes more negative. And if we reach back into our brains and we talk about a negative delta G, what does that mean as far as spontaneity of that reaction occurring? It increases the possibility of more. If we have a negative delta G, it's more likely to be a spontaneous reaction. So the way that we can, the connection that we can draw here, an increase in entropy, right, gives us a more negative delta G, resulting in the reaction being more likely to be spontaneous. <clears throat> And this is about the depth that he's going to want you to go in understanding it. OK, he might ask the question more in this sort of way. We're like, OK, you drop in a salt and it breaks off into two. What's uh, what happens to our delta G? Delta G is going to go down. We go going down towards zero or more towards negative. Or he'll tell you that he <clears throat> that he adds you add more heat into the into the um, into the system. So by adding, uh, it might be a little too late for me to like time wise of the night for me to dive into the full explanation because I don't want to say things wrong and confuse you guys. Um, let's go ahead and, and stop here on entropy. <clears throat> I think this will make a lot more sense. Um, we kind of looked at this. We have entropy. We have enthalpy. Um, definition wise, this will make a lot more sense if we do the practice questions. So <clears throat> I'd say if you have access to the Linus learning questions, start to take a look at them and try to kind of use this equation to break down the bioenergetics understanding of if one thing changes why does delta g change and how does it change that sort of stuff but understanding definition wise entropy and then we're actually going to change enthalpy to a delta e being the total change in internal energy of the system. So this is again, it's like, is it endergonic or exergonic? Is energy being released? Is energy being absorbed? That kind of change of energy <coughs> and how that affects the reaction being spontaneous or not. Okay, but I think I don't want to go too, mu too much deeper into this. So let's go ahead and stop and pause here. Um, and we'll pick this back up. So do you guys do you guys know when the date is of your next exam? I think I have it on a sticky note on my desktop. Give me just a second. For blended, it's March 10th, I think. Well, it's after March 1st because I don't have it on my sticky note. So it's okay. probably that same okay. week. I'm looking it up right now. <laughs> okay, so we have a little bit of time. So we'll um plan on the on next week hitting these questions 
and then I'll go over this a little bit more as well. And then we can also go over. Jeez, where is? It's March 11th. Okay, March 11th. <clears throat> yeah, because then that'll be really, really good because then next week we can go over bioenergetics. Um, the intro to carbohydrates. A lot of this, like carbohydrates wise, um, if you watch my YouTube video on this stuff, it covers this really, really well. Um, we'll probably want to do, we'll do a handful of the bioenergetics questions. Most of these questions in carbohydrates, a lot of it, to be honest, is just kind of raw memorization um where knowing like names of certain things and um and kind of how these things fit together and we'll so we'll probably and honestly this wasn't a ton the intro to carbohydrates he didn't hit this super hard in the exams um what i from what i remember but what he does hit really really hard is glycolysis and so i think maybe next week you guys should be introduced to glycolysis, and I think we might go ahead and jump into glycolysis. We'll do the bioenergetics question. If you have questions about intro to carbohydrates, we can look at those. But then we'll hit jump right into glycolysis and really hit glycolysis hard because that is by far one of the most important um, glycolysis. And the next week, the TCA cycle, electron transport chain, these three by far like are where a majority of kind Ask of questions for exam three come from oh yeah so i think glycolysis is i think glycolysis is this test and then is it it might be tca as well the citric acid cycle TCA, AKA, AKA. i think citric acid and krebs i believe is exam three okay so we'll take a look at this so it might be glycolysis and he might spend more than a week on by call yeah so we'll we'll take a look at those and we'll, we'll i'll make sure to get the linus learning questions ahead of time and we'll really hit glycolysis because at glycolysis this is one um i would highly recommend get onto ninja nerd or onto my on my youtube videos as well i will break down and walk through glycolysis step by step by step and like start watching that and prepping for that now because that's one that's going to just take a long time to to memorize so well we'll we'll get to that and we'll cover that okay so i think today we're going to go ahead and end it there thank you guys so much for showing up i hope you guys have a great day glad you made it through all your tests and i will see you later thank, thank you, thanks Greg. Greg. Have a good night. Good night. You too.